Welcome, everybody. We have an excellent show for you today. Liz Gendro from Chief Mom Officer joins me to talk about how she's been able to develop a six-figure career and still have time to be a mom to her three boys. Liz works full-time in the tech industry for a Fortune 100 company. By having a saver's mindset and growing her income from $22,000 to six figures, she has helped her family reach millionaire status in her 30s. Liz has been featured in Business Insider and was a Plutus Award finalist for Best Family Finance blog last year. Welcome to the show, Liz. Oh, thanks for having me, Andy. Glad to be on. Absolutely. Well, you always you weren't always a millionaire mom. So, h- how did you start off your career? <laughs> yeah, so I started off making $22,000 a year working full-time in a call center uh, at the age of 18 because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So, I started out there and started working full-time and going to school full-time evenings and weekends, uh, because the call center paid for education. So I kept that up for four years and went from a community college to getting my bachelor's degree, switched into IT during my last semester of college, where I only made $35,000 a year. And then over time, I've been able to change jobs, change projects and grow my career to this point. Excellent. Very cool. So you're telling me that somebody can go to community college and then still make six figures down the road? That just seems wrong. All I'm hearing now is that I need to save (laughs) hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for my little Zoe to go to, you know, the the four year university. But uh, you're telling me it's the you're telling me it's the opposite. (laughs) I don't know if you can sense my sarcasm. (laughs) (laughs) I sure can. No, it's certainly possible. And there's actually another friend of mine, the FI journeyman, who started out the same way I did. He was working full time and he went to community college, transferred to a four year school, got his bachelor's. And now he's also a millionaire. So it's certainly possible. It just takes a lot of hard work and dedication and time. Very cool. Well, once you had um, finished your your undergrad and you started to get your your full time career going, what did you do to to take those steps from your initial salary in your early twenties to where you are now in order to build up your salary? I know a lot of people kind of get stuck, you know, in in the work environment and say, you know, I really want to increase my salary. I just don't don't know what to do. So, could you give us some insight on what you did in order to you know make that shift? Sure. So it's a lot of different things over a long period of time, right? So in my early 20s to now, I'm 37, so it's 15 years. So over the last 15 years, I've done a lot of different things, each of which has increased my salary somewhat to get up all the way up to the point where it is now. Mm -hmm. So I've done things like change jobs, change positions. I've gotten promotions and raises. Um, I have always taken on more than just my day job. So whatever it was I was doing, I would always volunteer for extra things. And that not only uh, let me gain new skills, but also let me meet other people who gave me other opportunities down the line. So I've also changed companies about uh, seven years ago now. I changed from a company that wasn't doing as well to a company that's doing really well. So I So really a lot of different things. I've shifted positions within IT. Mm -hmm. So started off very low level uh, systems analyst. And right now I'm a program manager. Excellent. That's great. And then so so your your flexibility, making connections, uh, not getting stuck in one spot, you know, being having the ability to look out and see what else is out there has kind of been your secret to success. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. Difficult because you can get stuck. And what I found is when I feel like I'm getting stuck, it's time to move hmm. and do something else. That's interesting. That's really good perspective. I like that. So you, you, you got your MBA as well. Did, how did that come into play? Was Did you feel like that was uh, worth the investment? It was for me. My company actually funded most of the MBA, not nice. all of it, but it was company reimbursed. So I would work full time during the day. And then e- again, evenings and weekends, I would take the classes to get my MBA. It took me about four years because I did it part-time, not Mm full-time. I had two kids at the time. So it took a while to finish, but it definitely helped. And now I have that MBA. And the great thing is that no one ever asks what 
college you first went to back when you first started your career they really care about your last college yeah so the the fact that my last college is an mba from my state's flagship university Mm -hmm. is helpful especially if you started off in community college because then you don't really have to talk about that unless you want to right well that's cool yeah that's that's a good thing to think about absolutely um (laughs) so when you when you finished the mba did did you go straight up to your supervisor and say Hey, it's salary increase time, or like how, how, did, how, did, the, how did those conversations happen? <laughs> no, it, I didn't, although maybe I should have, but I didn't. <laughs> no. So, the way that it's worked because I've stayed with the same company mm-hmm. since I got the MBA was really that as I was getting it, I was also getting uh, positions of increased responsibility. So, it's in def- other projects as well that were more complex and more difficult to do because I was gaining those skills over the years. So that's the advantage of working while you get a Mm -hmm. degree is that you get those increases over that whole time instead of at the end trying to find a job where you can get the big salary all at once. Right. Well, that's good. It sounds like you're at a great organization that has those progressive levels of um, opportunity for you as well. So that's great. So um, you, you, you've been able to build your career in the tech industry. And, you know, I was doing some research and I read a study uh, on the site Hired that uh, women receive lower salary offers than men for the same job at the same company 63% of the time. Have you experienced in this any of this pay inequality in your 15-year career in the tech industry? Oh, yeah, definitely. So when I got my very first job in IT, uh, as I mentioned, I was making $35,000 a year. Yeah. Now, for me, coming from a call center where I was making 30000 I was like, woohoo, 5000 extra dollars. Mm-hmm. That's great. Um, but then my next boss, after the, the one that had hired me, took one look at that and was like, what the hell is wrong with you? Oh, yeah. Because it was, it was so tremendously low. Hmm. Careers in IT, I didn't know it, but careers in IT don't start off at $35,000 mm-hmm. usually. So they had really... I was young, didn't know any better, but they had really taken advantage of the fact that I was young and didn't know any better and lowballed me. And I had accepted it because it was more money to me. Hmm. And so with with that experience, with that feedback that you got from your your supervisor, how has that changed your, I guess, the the way you go about things as as a career going forward? Does does that change how you approach, um, you know, conversations around compensation, conversations around uh, promotions, things like that? Oh, definitely. So it made me aware that I should really be researching these things because, again, I was young. I didn't really know what I should be doing so that I should research these things, see what other companies are paying, see what's comparable at my own company, Mm -hmm. at least according to public information. And also in terms of responsibility, right, having those conversations about what I should be doing next and what I need to do to grow into that, it help me learn that those are conversations I need to be having. Yeah. What type of research sites or uh, resources are you using in order to make those comparisons? Usually Glassdoor is what I use, but I've uh, always worked for bigger companies. But even with Glassdoor, you can look in your same general region Mm -hmm. and you can see what positions are out there that are roughly comparable to yours in terms of length of time in the industry and uh, amount of responsibility, and you could see the range of salaries that they should be paying. Okay. So you could use that information to negotiate to make sure that you're getting paid what you're worth. Okay, cool. So if if, if women are in this situation in uh, the tech industry or any industry, really, what can what what can they do to combat this gender pay inequality that you're seeing? Well, definitely, they can do their research ahead of time. Make sure that they know what they're worth. And not be afraid to ask for it. I think a lot of times we women feel really awkward asking for more money mm-hmm. or they think that they're going to be seen as greedy. Yeah. But it's really about being paid what you're worth. And if the work you're doing is the same as your coworker sitting in the next cube, you should be pay, getting paid comparably yeah. to them. Absolutely. So. And, and so for those, for those men and women that are in leadership roles that are maybe listening to this right now, you know, what, what, what do you think that they could do to help combat this inequality? I mean, is it just being aware that this, this exists and, you know, trying to do their best to combat it? What what do you think? Yeah, I definitely think they need to be aware it exists. uh, And they need to be aware that a lot of times women out there 
are reluctant to negotiate because they're afraid of feeling awkward or being seen as being too pushy. Mm -hmm. So it's really up to people in leadership positions to make sure that they're paying their employees what they're worth and that it's not based on how little you can get that employee for, but it's really being based on what are their responsibilities, how is their performance, and how does that compare with their peers. Very cool. All right, this is this is good. This is a good conversation. So uh, let, let, let's talk about the the men and women that are that are looking to increase their salary. You know, we talked a little bit about how you did that. Do you have any advice for for folks who are building their career right now and saying, "Hey, I'd really like to take some steps to build my career." Uh, let's say let's say I'm in my 30s and I've kind of been stagnant for a little while in the same position. What are what are some steps that I could take? Some baby steps in order to you know increase my position, increase my salary. So the key for me personally has been education and growing my skill set above and beyond what my day job technically requires, right? So education's not necessarily the right path for everyone. Mm -hmm. It really depends on what's your job and what are you looking to grow into. But in a lot of cases, if you get additional education or if you're looking to switch fields and you want to get a certificate or a degree in a different field, It could be a great option to grow your salary or help you change into a career that's more in line with what you want. The other thing, as I mentioned, is really growing skills outside of my day job. So I think we can all get kind of stuck in a rut where we go in and do our job and go home and then we're tired (laughs) and we don't or we have three kids like I do and we don't really (laughs) necessarily want to spend more time doing more things. But I've definitely found that joining clubs say at work or joining other initiatives that are going on that really have nothing to do with what I do on a day-to-day basis has really helped me make a lot of connections. Uh, Like for example, there was a group I joined at my company that was uh, not quite a club, but it was just a initiative that they were doing. And it didn't involve IT specifically. It had people from all over the company. So I attended this, went to some events, talked to other people, and eventually that led directly to the opportunity to speak at one of our town halls in front of all 40,000 some odd employees. Wow. That's cool. Very cool. So it's what you never know what opportunities it will lead to. So I've always found that volunteering and doing those extra things on top of what you do day to day is really helpful. That's good. Put yourself out there, people. I like it. (laughs) Yep. So let's say um, let's say I've been providing a lot of value to my company, and I've got some metrics to prove it, and I'm I'm ready to have that conversation with management on, hey, I need to I need a I need a salary increase. Well, what are what are some steps that you would share on on that process? I know you've been through it yourself, probably. Yep. So if you've got the facts and metrics to prove it, it's a pretty easy case. I would pull together those facts. What are you being paid now? What's the salary range that's acceptable typically for what you're doing? What's the difference? And probably practice it yourself too, because as I said, sometimes we could feel awkward about having those conversations. Mm -hmm. So I think practicing it either with yourself or with a friend or partner and trying to anticipate some of the questions or uh, potential objections that might come up and also making sure that you have an alternative alternative. So there's a concept in negotiation called the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, Hmm. which is where you know, what are you going to do if they say no? Are you going to, are you going to make another offer? Like what's going to be worth it to you? Maybe you would take a smaller increase in salary for a few extra days of vacation, or perhaps you'd take a smaller increase in order to have a clear path to a promotion within the next year. Or maybe you're just going, if they say no, you're just going to go and find another job that pays you what you're worth. So walking into a negotiation, knowing what are your, what else could you offer? And then what are you going to do if they say no? And making sure you're confident about that helps you be more confident in the negotiation itself. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. I, you know, I've had some conversations with people. You, you don't get what you don't ask for, right? I mean, with anything, you're going to the store and the price says this. 
hey, if you ask, you could probably get it for less. You're making this salary, and you, you're currently making that. But if you don't ask to change it, then it, it's the, sort of the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? <laughs> right. It's it's not like they're usually going to dock your salary for asking. Exactly. So if you ask for more money, they're not going to say, well, now that you asked, I'm going to pay you less money. Right. <laughs> so what's the worst could happen? Think of that, right? Like the worst they could just say is, nope. <laughs> and how right. bad is but, that? They'll just say no. And as long as you go into it, not confrontational, but right. just being fact based and seeking like a partnership with mm -hmm. them because they have a vested interest in keeping you as an employee. It's difficult to replace an employee, especially a very good employee. Mm -hmm. It costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. Yes. And it's difficult. So they have a um, an interest in keeping you happy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, cool. I was, I was hoping to talk a little bit about family with you today too. So, um, you, you're building your, your career in it and, you know, uh, and, and developing that and, and to your status that you're in, has it been difficult to keep a quality relationship with your, with your family, your husband, your boys, as you develop your uh, career, or are you in a, in a good spot? No, I think we're in a good spot over the last 15 years. It's been different at different points in my career and my life. Right. So in my early career, when I didn't have as much responsibility, it was pretty easy to not work crazy hours most of the time mm -hmm. and be home a lot. Yeah. So my husband and I have had a lot of different working arrangements over the last uh, 14 years since our oldest son was born. And we've done things like we both worked full time, but on opposite shifts. We've done where I have worked full time and he's worked part time. Mm -hmm. And right now I work full time and he's a stay at home dad. Okay. So those different shifts over time have really helped us not only balance family and work, but also, you know, as my career takes off, he's been able to handle a lot of the home things so that when I am home, we can just have fun and spend quality time together and not worry about grocery shopping or cleaning the house. Yeah, that's great flexibility. And, and uh, I remember hearing your kids ages, you've got um, uh, some teenagers and then like a, a young toddler. Is that right? <laughs> Yep. They're 14, 10, and 3. 14, Just turned 10, 3, three. three on Sunday, actually. Oh, that's great. I've got a 3-year-old right now, too. It's a ton of fun. <laughs> <laughs> fun is uh, an interesting word. For Absolutely. Put some quotes around it, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Air quotes. That's fun. <laughs> do you have to travel much for your position right now? And, you know, with the, with the situation with your family and your husband staying at home, do you, do you travel, um, you know, around the country or anything like that or globally? I do travel around the country sometimes, mm -hmm. so it's not every week or every month, but several times a year usually I am traveling for work. Okay. So it's and having him, yeah, no. Mm -hmm. So and having him at home is definitely very helpful with that again, because then I don't have to worry about who's going to take care of the kids or what am I going to do with them, mm -hmm. right? And back when he was working, I didn't really travel for work, or when I did, it was very difficult. We had to get family involved and all those kind of things. Okay. So it's much easier this way. Very cool. Well, uh, you know, you and I, it, sound, it sounds like you've got a career that, that fulfills you and that you're, you're interested in it, you know, provides a balance and, uh, you know, good income for your family. And that's helped you to reach this millionaire status. You know, you, you and I have been involved in some conversations uh, in this little community that we're in, uh, the, fi <laughs> the fire movement, or the financial independence, retire early community. Um, uh, community. Does it, do any of those conversations inspire you? Are they interesting to you? Or, or how does that balance with your career that you have today? So I like to call FIRE financial independence retirement elective because a lot of people looking to reach financial independence don't actually want to stop working. Mm -hmm. They either want to keep working and what they're doing but have more freedom and more security or they might want to change what they're doing and having financial independence helps them to launch a business mm -hmm. or potentially shift into a less demanding or a, um, a different kind of career that might not pay as much, mm -hmm. right? So... I'm definitely all for financial independence. Personally, I want to retire earlier than, say, 65 or 70 that, that folks talk about. But obviously, I'm not retiring at 35 because I'm 37 and I can't <laughs> go back in time. <laughs> you know, so I, and I have other financial goals. So financial independence is very important to me. I'm looking to get rid of my mortgage within the next couple of years to increase financial security. But I'm also am looking to help the three boys through college and a very specified level and plan. So mm. it's, um, and I have other goals too. I'd love to be able to start some scholarships or something that helps out other people who started where more where I did. Cause I know what I've accomplished is not necessarily typical. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who I met in community college, 
honestly, who were working full time and going back to school in their 30s or 40s or had kids or other kinds of situations that is very difficult. So I'd love to one day be able to help them as well. That's great. So I'd say, yeah, I've got other financial goals that aren't necessarily mean I'm going to retire and go sit on a beach or travel around the country <laughs> anytime soon. And I do like what I do as well. So, um, but I'm definitely looking to retire before 65. That's cool. Yeah. I don't like those stock photos where it shows, uh, you have to be at least uh, 70 with gray hair and all you're doing is either sitting on a porch or on a beach somewhere or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's just not me. Like I, my whole life I've been working full time, working and going to school, working, going to school and having kids. Right. So uh, Work, right now, working, having kids, and running a website. Mm -hmm. So it's um, I like to be busy. I like to be doing a lot of things. It's just kind of my personality. I think research shows, scientific research shows, that that's probably a good way to live, even even for <laughs> your mental capacity and your physical capacity. Keep yourself busy. <laughs> Keep something that you're interested in. I mean, we don't have to grind away until we're you know crazy, but there's a balance, right? You got to do something that you know provides you um, a purpose and 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 you know meaning. And 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 if you're and you probably get a sense of uh, fulfillment because you're helping out your family and helping them to have the ability to go to college and, and do all those amazing things and, and help back and give to your community too. So I applaud yep. you for that. Absolutely. So you mentioned, um, you mentioned the college savings for the kids. So I'm interested in your thoughts. You've got a 14 year old right now. Do you, yes. uh, and you, and you saw your path, how you were able to I guess almost mitigate a little bit of the cost of going to university full time. Are you are you saving up uh, right now five twenty nine or plan for uh, your your children to go through four years of university, or do you like that co uh, community college for a couple of years and then move to the university kind of plan that you did? So right now I am saving for them to go to more of a university, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but I know going to community college is possible. So my goals have really changed over the years as my income has changed. Yeah. Back when he was born, um, I was 23. Mm -hmm. I had just finished college two months before he was born. And at the time, I, that was when I was making $35,000 a year. Yeah. And my husband was making less. Mm -hmm. So it was um, my college goals at that time were very modest. I would put aside you know, 50 bucks a month every month, and it was going to be whatever was there. I would help. And then whatever wasn't there, I would help him figure out a path. Mm -hmm. Right? He could take the same path I did, or he could take a different path. But over the years, since my income has changed, I've been able to change that goal. So right now, my goal is to be able to fund with our state's university, pay for him to go there if he wishes. And if he wants to go to a more expensive school, okay, then I'm going to help him figure out how to do that, hopefully without taking out loans, mm -hmm. either going one place and transferring or, you know, there's a lot of other options out there. And if he goes to a less expensive school or takes a different or he's not sure what he wants to do, then I'm going to talk to him about that, the community college type path. Because when you're not sure what you want, yeah. then it's a really a great option to get the, some of those basic credits under your belt while you're trying to figure that out. So my son actually right now, the oldest, the 14 year old, he's a freshman in high school. He goes to an arts magnet school. Hmm. Uh, yeah. So he's very interested in the arts as a potential career that's great so we, yeah so we talk a lot about different career options that involve the arts like mm -hmm. you know marketing and graphic design and things like that so that's great well that's that's interesting that he um is aware of that so early on in high school i think that's that's a rarity where i think i was uh 27 by the time i'd figured out what i wanted to do no. <laughs> yeah no I, I'm with you. And I, you know, I talked to him also about the fact that it may change over time. Right. Mm -hmm. And arts careers are difficult yeah. and low paying. So he's going to have to be willing to take on, you know, waitering type jobs or drive mm -hmm. Ubers or something if sure. he wants to be an artist. Absolutely. OK, cool. And then you said another one of your goals is to, to pay off that mortgage. So how's that process going for you guys? And what's your um, what's your what's your goal right now? So my goal is to have it paid off before I'm 40. Okay. As I mentioned, I'm 37, but yep. I'm almost 38. Mm -hmm. So right now, the way that we've uh, done it, we've done two primary things. One is we have a 15-year mortgage and we're five years into it. Mm -hmm. So that means at worst, it would be another 10 years and yep. it's going to be paid off entirely. Nice. Um, and then the other thing is I have a, essentially a mortgage payoff fund 
So I save in that every time I get any kind of extra income or a bonus or anything, it goes in there. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to have that exceed the mortgage balance and then pay it off. Nice. Where where are you putting that money, that fund? Are you, it's not principal payments, it's in like a brokerage account and then you're going to pay it off eventually. Is that how you're doing it? It's in a uh, money market account. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. Because I don't want it. You don't want it in the market. That makes sense right now. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It's short term. I don't want it in the market. We just, um, I've found before when I paid, because I've kind of tried to pay extra before Uh on principal. And what's happened when I did that is that it all got locked up in the house. And I'm just a little bit risk averse because I've been through the Great Recession, right? I've been through seeing lots of people get laid off and Mm -hmm. just the, the security of that always concerns me so i try to take a balanced approach absolutely that's a that's a good idea especially lately i mean you have to be flexible depending (laughs) on the times i mean this first quarter in the market has been i mean by the time this comes out i don't know how the second quarter will do but the first quarter in the market has been um pretty dismal for all of us so (laughs) so okay well cool i've been an investor Mm -hmm. go ahead i've been an investor a long time Mm -hmm. and i know that uh you don't want money in the market if you want it in the next couple of years because it can go down. It can stay down for a long time. Yeah. Well, it's, it sounds like you you've you've been at this for a while. This this savings mindset, the the investing mindset. Did did your parents help you with any of that uh, type of information, or did you stumble across this yourself? How did how did that uh, how did you grow up into this? Uh, it's it's both really. So my parents helped me as a teenager. My father specifically with opening up an IRA, which was really great in the 90s when I was a teenager because you kind of got to see the stock run up. And then I also got to the pleasure of going through the year 2000 where the dot-com bubble burst and mm. it lost like all the money. Oh my! <laughs> but not, not all of it, but most of it. It was in a Janus 20 fund, which did not do well in the uh, dot-com bubble burst. So, and, and my parents were always savers and pretty smart with their money. So they weren't big spenders. They paid off their mortgage early-ish, I think in their 40s. So they've, um, and they always live below their means. So they Mm -hmm. got a lot of valuable lessons from them. And specifically about investing and kind of the the financial side of things. When I was a teenager, I read this book called The Wealthy Barber, which is not well known now, but it's a classic. So when I read it, it would have been in the 90s when it was still relevant. It's really kind of outdated now. But as a teenager, it was written as a story. So I found it interesting. And it talked all about investing. It talked about how you didn't need to make a lot of money in order to save, invest, and the power of compound interest over time would let your savings accumulate into something that's, you know, much bigger than you could imagine. Talked about real estate and taxes and kind of all the financial basics. Mm. And at, at the time, I really loved it because, like I said, it was written as a story. So it was interesting, but I also learned all this stuff. So that book really inspired me to always be interested in personal finance and investing. And I'm the kind of person that was reading, you know, Your Money or Your Life in my early 20s and those all those kind of books before the age of the Internet and, you know, financial blogs and sites getting really big. Yeah. Well, that's cool. It's, it's good that you're, you're, you had the influence of your parents, but then you also had to drive yourself to, to educate yourself. So how are you... Um influencing this this sort of money mindset with your kids now are you doing anything to help them think proactively about their money even though they're they're younger in age oh yeah we talk a lot about personal finance and wise spending and it the the exact conversations vary depending on their ages and maturity level right so the conversations i have with my 14 year old are very different than my 10 year old uh, and then the three-year-old, we're still working on don't eat the money. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the number, most valuable. Number one rule. First. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> number one rule for toddlers, don't eat money. <laughs> but I, I definitely focus on kind of the underpinnings of financial lessons, like the fact that you should spend less than you make and you should save, how to make a wise spending decision, how to seek out things that are, you know, alternative options that might be lower cost, how mm-hmm. to judge a good purchase, those kind of things. And then my 14-year-old, since he's now in high school, our money conversations get more detailed. We talk a little bit more about stock market investing and saving for retirement and those kinds of things. 
Excellent. Well, that's great. Well, it's, that's how you do it. That's how you build a family legacy, everybody. Very cool. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned The Wealthy Barber. Is there any other book that uh, you've enjoyed lately that, um, that you'd recommend to folks uh, to help them uh, build their either bir- build their personal finance journey here or even just their career success? I know we've, uh, we've talked about that a lot today. Yeah, so I loved Your Money or Your Life, which I mentioned as well. Mm-hmm. When I read it, it was in the early 2000s. I still have that copy. But I know a new edition just came out with a forward by uh, Mr. Money Mustache. Mm-hmm. And Vicki Robbins wrote that with uh, Grant from Millennial Money. So I'm really looking forward to getting the new version. Mm-hmm. It's excited, exciting to see it updated. Uh, so I definitely recommend checking out that one. Um, in terms of career books, it's really difficult because they tend to get dated pretty fast. <laughs> um, I've always found the Harvard Business Review actually has really good career books on leadership, management, women in business, and things like that. So I've gotten several of their books and read them. And um, But really, right now, a lot of the information uh, available online, either for free or with digital subscriptions, is really kind of where I go. That's great. Very cool. Any, any blogs that you're, you're loving nowadays that uh, help people on, on that side of things with their career? Oh, I love Ask a Manager. Mm. I've always loved to, loved Allison's blog there. So she posts multiple times a day with different questions on different career uh, choices and situations. So I've always loved that one. She's got some really good advice and you get to see um, a myriad of different kinds of questions so you can easily find something that's applicable to what you want to know very cool very cool well liz thanks so much for uh taking time to um spend with me this morning where's the best place for people to follow you and learn more about you well you can always visit my website uh, chiefmomofficer.org and i write a couple times a week all about money work financial freedom i've got a lot of great interviews with uh, women seeking financial freedom and breadwinning six-figure millionaire moms. So that's a great place to find me. And usually I'm hanging out on Twitter. So I'm at Liz Officer. So you can always connect with me there. I love those tweets. Keep them coming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right. that's where we talk. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for being with me this morning. Oh, thanks for having me. I had a great time.